So you've got these very tough muscular dogs who do very, very powerful things. Well, you know, the interesting thing to me is that that just described a greyhound. If you've ever looked at a uh, racing greyhound, regardless of how you feel about the ethics of greyhounds racing, if you've ever looked at a racing greyhound, you've got a large, finely tuned athletic machine. They're heavily muscular. But people don't think of those as dogs that need a strong hand. And they outweigh most pit bulls by often twice. So we've bought into this whole idea of a dog that was developed in part to control stock by biting them. Well, you've also just described border collies, which often come in at 25 pounds. You know, they can be tiny. You've described Australian shepherds, which can be anywhere from, God, just in our household alone, we have ones that are 45 pounds to 70 pounds you know, and they're all rescues, so they can be highly variable. Um, if you want to look at some dogs that have worked stock, look at corgis, look at poodles, you know, so there's, these are all breeds that have been adapted to do some herding and grabbing, but what's the one element that everybody's chosen to emphasize here? These dogs, toughness. And in fact, if you look at Staffordshire Bull Terriers, one of the breeds that probably went into the American Pit Bull, and you look at them in Australia, they are considered the quintessential family dog. Because they are tough, they are little tanks, they're short, they're relatively small compared to our dogs, and you know a kid can fall over them, but he's not gonna bowl them over, so they're not damaging the kids. And these are actually the phenotypes or behaviors that we see in most of these dogs. You know, the average pit bull that I see as a pet, um, you probably, if you stomped on it enough times, it might react. But these are, these are smart, intelligent, lovely, incredibly gentle dogs. So how does that reconcile with this image that we're talking about? <laughs>
you know, all of us have had those dogs. Um, my first Australian Shepherd, Maggie, I would practically kill to have that dog back. I'd practically kill to have Flash back. Um, but the dog I got, even from cloning Flash, wouldn't be Flash. Because although I had his genes, all his environmental things would be different. And I would never, ever dream of putting a dog through the hell Flash had to go to. Even when you clone something, in other words, you don't change the genetic makeup at all. Um, you don't get the same dog because of the environmental influences. So when people um, think that all pit bulls are just born aggressive, that it's in the genes, What's in the genes is a propensity to be able to exhibit a certain range of behaviors. All genes do for you is outline what things are possible. So all your genes do is tell you what's possible. They don't tell you what will happen. So does that mean that things don't run in family lines? No, things run in family so very often what you'll see in dogs is that um, a good line of working dogs produces good working dogs but part of that may be what they're able to learn from the dogs that are good working dogs um, do excellent lines of working dogs ever produce losers absolutely they produce them a huge amount of the time um, look at horse racing horses you know, everybody wants the next Secretariat. Well, guess what? Secretariat was pretty much bred to death. Um, you know, he was bred to a number of horses. Um, his progeny and his grandkids and his great-grandkids and everybody else are all on the ground. Never produced another horse like Secretariat. Even if they got the exact gene combination, you wouldn't have had the trainers, you wouldn't have had the other horses you were racing against, you wouldn't have had any of those things. So when you breed things, you, you mess up all the genes. So in theory, you get half from mom and half from dad. But what you're really getting is some assortment of mom's grandparents and dad's grandparents. And then maybe mom's genes are more expressed than dad's genes. And maybe, because epigenetic effects are huge. And maybe mom was more laid back than dad was. And now you've got them in an environment where, um, you know, laid back dogs are well loved and you produce a perfect dog. Yet if you put that dog in an environment where they didn't like a laid back dog and they wanted the dog to be fiercer and they kept poking at it with sticks, now that dog's a basket case. So, you know, we're not to say that it's in their genes is truly simplistic. The best example of that I can give is that even if you take the same dog um, who's got a problem aggression and it gets competent behavioral help from a specialist who might use medication and environmental modification and behavior modification, that dog becomes a different dog. That dog actually becomes itself without the fears, without the anxieties, without the aggressions. So if you can change that one dog, then it's not in their genes. The capacity to change is in their genes, and how easy it will be to do that is there. And we've bred for um, tenacity in a lot of breeds, you know, and that's what, I think that's the one thing that when people think about um, any of the Mastiff breeds who've worked, that they don't realize is we've bred for dogs who will endure, you know, and these dogs will just keep at it. They'll endure just about anything you throw at them because that's one of the things that we ask the breed to do. When people live in an apartment and they want to get a Dalmatian, I make sure they know what a carding dog is because we ask carding dogs, Dalmatians, Vichelas, all of these market day dogs who would accompany and to some extent protect everybody as they brought their crops and their sheep and things to market. Um, 35 miles in one day and not tired. If you're not up to exercising a dog who can walk 35 miles in one day and not tire, perhaps a Dalmatian in an apartment is not your best bet. So the same thing pertains to these dogs. So does that mean we can't select for a dog who can do certain things? Can we select for a more muscular dog? Yes. Can we select for a tougher dog? Yes. Can we select for dogs that don't feel pain as much? We can select for dogs who will largely ignore painful circumstances. It's what we select for in a lot of hunting and herding dogs. 
you know, they go through gores. If you've got your basic Springer Spaniel, who's going to wince every time it hits a rose bush, it's not going to bring back the dead duck, okay, because it's got to hook up in all of that stuff. So could we do that by brutality? Oh, you bet. Of course we can. Um, but does that mean that you're going to get a dog who wants to kill other dogs or um, who wants to kill people? Here's the tip off. No matter where that dog came from, um, you have to train dogs to do those things. If you t have to teach them to do it, it's not all in the gene. So we've certainly taken dogs who've um, been taught to kill other dogs and brought those dogs into homes where they are terrific pets. Um, there are some risks you might not want to take in rehabilitating those dogs. Would I want a bunch of kittens sort of hanging around? Possibly not. But that's because I don't want to know what that dog will do. Um, can that dog do well in a family with kids? Absolutely. You know, but that's a rehabilitation situation we're talking about where the dog's been tremendously abused and traumatized. These dogs don't come out as natural killers of anything. Now there's there's a, a line of thinking. I've read uh, the Colby book, who you know who Lewis Colby is the breeder, and I've spoken to Diane Jessup uh, about this. And basically, breeding fight dogs is like breeding any other kind of dog. It's a crapshoot. And Col yeah. Colby yeah. said that five out of a hundred dogs might have it, that little thing, and that you don't. And he even yeah. wanted to say yeah. that you don't train a dog to fight it either. It has it when it goes in the box or it doesn't. It's interesting because that's what all working dog people will tell you. And it doesn't matter if it's a gun dog, you know, to bring back the dead duck, or if it's a detection dog to detect a bomb, or if it's a herding dog to grab a sheep. You know, what they do with these young dogs is they want to put in minimum effort to shape these dogs as possible, okay? We know it's a learning thing, but we'd like to make it easy on ourselves. So what you look for is talent. So what they, they did was they looked for somebody with an aptitude. It's not easy because we don't know what that actual aptitude is or we'd be doing it all the time. Every working dog program has at least a, well, if you look at it over time, they tend to fail about 30 to 70% of their dogs. Okay, if you look at all the programs over time, 30 to 70%. Those dogs don't have a 90% success rate in other environments without their trainers and their handlers because they've got a very well-educated group of people who are all always working together to get this dog who can do this one thing, okay? Maybe it's a problem for you because it's gonna be a lot of work to train, but even if the dog is interested, that dog may not make the cut because it's got to do lots of other things. It's got to be able to do that in an airport where there's huge amounts of noise, where there are lots of people, oh, and not bite anybody if they get banged by a piece of luggage. You know, and by the time you go through all of that other stuff, even if you've got the talent, um, maybe you just don't want to do it. I mean, how many kids have a huge amount of talent musically but really don't want to be a concert pianist? You know, they don't want, to, they don't want that lifestyle. Um, so motivation has a lot to do with it. Well, you know, and that's part of the thing that people try to assess. We have a real hard time measuring motivation, and it's one reason I almost never use the word. We measure motivation in a very funny way. We measure motivation in most experiments by how hard you will work to get something we've taken away from you. And it's usually food. You know, so how many times will a horse press a bar to get a little scoop full of grain? How often will a mouse press a bar to get some cocaine in, you know, an addiction experiment? How many times will an animal press a bar to avoid a shot? So getting something and avoiding something may not be the same. And they're usually not, in fact. And it depends on how awful the other thing is. Um, you know, you can tell how often we use heinous types of punishment for my dogs based on it. The extinction bursts that aren't happening with the ones that are barking in the background. So we have trouble evaluating motivation, but wanting to do something does one thing for you. It makes you easy to teach, and anybody can teach you. 
the single biggest problem we have with getting most working dogs, and I don't care whether you know it's some dogs rounding up bulls or it's a dog who's finding explosives, is in getting the human dog to work well together. Um, in fighting dogs, they try to take that out of it, but they don't because the dogs are afraid of the humans. Don't forget, fighting is illegal, it's inhumane. Let's make sure we understand that. These dogs can't bite the human. If they bite the human, they're dead. So now we've got a group of dogs who have, who have been pathologically damaged to do something they would not normally do in an extreme set of circumstances where they're not allowed to let their feelings about it be known. And we wonder why they have a problem. 